Today I'm going to talk about an integral that is not easily calculable through conventional means. So I'm going to use the residue theorem to calculate this integral. And the integral is this one. It's x to the power of alpha minus 1, where alpha varies between 0 and 2, and it has to be smaller than 2, uh, for reasons we will see later. Divide it over x squared plus 1. Okay, and we're going to use the residue theorem, which is defined as such. If you have a complex function, complex analytical function, over a contour, that equals 2 pi i times the residue of the FCs. And the residues in a point are defined as such. If you have multiple residues in the same point, you have to use this formula to calculate the residues. And we will see later how that goes. What we also need is the definition of the z to the power alpha, because z to the power alpha is a multi-valued function. Uh, we can define that as such. And the only thing I'm going to focus on today is on uh, the main branches. So k will be 0 in this case. So we only will look at z to the power alpha equals e to the alpha log z absolute plus i argument of z. And we're not going to take care of k today. Okay, that will be 0. The contour that we're choosing is the following contour. We have a cut at p pi over here so that is something you don't want to jump over and our contour will go from start from r which is uh, going to infinity to epsilon which is going to zero to mimic this integral in the complex plane this is the complex plane then we have a small circle around this cut this branch cut and then we go back from epsilon to r and then we go in infinity we circle back to the top, all the way to the top, without going over the branch cut, right? And that closes the integral, so we can use the residue theorem, okay? So the various paths that we're going to take a look at is L1 and L2, of course, and the small circle and the big circle. We will later see that these circles will tend towards zero, and I will show you how you can see that. And these ones are the important ones, the L1 and the L2. So L1 is on top of the branch cut. So angles there will run from zero all the way up to plus pi. And if you go to the bottom, angles will run from zero all the way up to minus pi. Okay. So L1, in this case, will have a z that equals e to the i pi over x. e to the i pi is exactly 180 degrees here. And uh, it will attach an x because x is running, it's running on the, uh, the real axis here. Okay, so that's z there. z at l2 is e to the minus i pi times x, right? Because you're under the branch. If you jump over a branch, you always jump 2 pi. Okay, so you go from i pi minus 2 pi is uh, minus i pi over here. The fz that we're going to use here is z to the power alpha minus 1 divided by c squared plus 1. So we translated this equation here into this fc. So now we essentially extend an equation that exists only on the, on the real axes. We extend it to the whole complex plane. Yeah, and this, this will be fc. Okay, so now let's try to calculate the four paths that will give FCDC. So we're focusing on the left side first and then we're gonna calculate the residues on the right hand side. But let's start with the left hand side. The left hand side is built up of four integrals. It's an integral L1, which is this path, then the little circle, C epsilon here, <coughs> then L2, you go back to here, and then the big circle, which tend toward infinity over there, okay? So now let's first see whether c epsilon and cr are both zero. If you look at c epsilon, the fc values that exist there on that path are epsilon e to the power i phi, where 
phi is running essentially from pi all the way up to minus pi here, okay? So you fill that out in your FC, where FC was defined as before, right? Over here, FC is this function here. So you fill that out and you get e to the power alpha minus one times e i phi alpha minus one d epsilon e i phi divided by e squared e two i phi if you fill this one out right in this is set z squared over here plus one so if epsilon goes to zero here we have an epsilon here there's an epsilon here to the power minus one that gives you e to the alpha at the top and e squared at the bottom okay so if epsilon tends towards zero then obviously um, this integral tends towards zero okay so that's the first one and that holds because alpha varies from zero to two if alpha would be negative this will blow up right so L, so alpha here as a consequence has to be bigger than zero otherwise it doesn't work okay let's be clear on that now let's go to the big one the big circle here same formula but now with a big r instead of an epsilon fill that out again and if you calculate that out you get again r to the power alpha divided over r squared but in this case r needs to go to infinity so it better be that alpha is smaller than two right because this r takes this minus one out so there's an alpha here and there's an r squared here. So if alpha would be bigger than two, this integral would blow up. If it's smaller than two, it will converge and goes to go to zero. So that's the reason why alpha need to vary between zero and two over here, okay? And if that's the case, then also this integral will go to zero. So that's the second one of the path. So now we can focus on L1 and L2. So we do that over here. FCDC now equals the L1 path with the function plus the L2 path with the function. Now we fill that out by the way we use, instead of z to the alpha minus one, we fill out this, this rule here, right? With k equals zero, we fill that out and then we get this result, okay? You get this result divided by c squared plus one. Same here for L2 exactly the same formula with c squared over 1 times dc now at the top here you go from r follow the the curve right you go from r to epsilon over here it's e to the alpha minus 1 log x because x is positive and it is plus i pi here because the angles are here positive on, on this curve so it's plus i pi here and z as we stated before is e to the i pi times x you fill that also out here for z squared, and you get this, right? Now e to the power of two pi i equals one, and so therefore you get x squared plus one at the bottom here, okay? The same you do for L2, but in L2's case, the angle now is not plus i pi, but minus i pi, because you are below the cut here. So you have to fill out minus i pi, and that's what we do here. Yeah, and the integral obviously goes from epsilon to r. Okay, so now we work this out. So if we work out the first one, we get e to the power pi alpha i at the top. That's this piece here, plus the i pi piece, uh, piece here. Okay, we wrote back e to the alpha minus one log x back to x to the alpha minus one over here. Okay. We have a minus one with an i pi here, which gives you a minus sign here. There's another minus sign here for e to the i pi. So that gives you plus. And then I flipped the integrations here from epsilon to r. It used to be uh, r to epsilon. So I flipped that. That's another minus. So it gives you an overall minus sign here with an e to the pi alpha i times this integral, which we will later call t. Okay. We do the same on this side for the second one. e to the minus i pi is obviously again minus 1. And then here you have another e to the i pi, which is minus 1 also. And that gives you a plus overall. And that's what you see here. You have your e to the 
i pi alpha over here the integral boundaries remain the same and you get an identical integral here what you want to do of course is you want to get this integral because this is the integral you're interested in and want to calculate so in its limit when epsilon goes to zero and r goes to infinity it's exactly the integral we're interested in so let's call this integral t over here and now we fill this out we copy this make this t do the same here and you can rewrite this out into a sign because this is a sign e to the pi alpha i minus e to the min minus pi alpha i over 2i is a sign so you divide it by 2i you have to multiply by an extra 2i here times that t integral so the left hand side is evaluated to be minus 2 ti sine pi alpha okay so now let's calculate the residues so we're going to focus on the right hand side of the equation and these this is how you calculate the residues there are essentially two residues here there's one at z is i and there's one at z is minus i and they both are in the contour so you both have to count them okay so you get 2 pi i residue of fc which is 2 pi i the residue in z is i plus the residue in c is minus i that's again 2 pi i times e to the power alpha minus 1 log i plus z is after all i pi plus i pi over 2 divided by i plus y and how do you do that well there's only one um, pole there so n equals 1 so you don't have to differentiate here but you do have to do a z minus z0 so a z minus i and if you do that there was z squared plus 1 which you could split up in z plus i and z minus i if you do that you are left with uh, z uh, plus i where you have to fill out i so you get i plus i because that one disappears right you multiply it so you multiply with a z uh, plus i uh, c minus i here at the top so the one at the bottom disappears and you're only left with c plus i at the bottom that's why you have i plus i here okay and the same for the residue in minus i then you're left with the other one and you get minus i minus i here and of course z at that point is minus i pi over 2 because of the uh, the residue there okay if you work that out you get e to the power alpha minus 1 pi over 2 i minus e to the minus alpha minus 1 pi over 2 i and you can rewrite this in a cosine form you can rewrite this into minus 2 pi i cosine this is a cosine pi over 2 alpha <clears throat> okay so these are the residues so now we can take the residues on the right hand side and the expression we already calculated of the contour integral on the left hand side and you have to match them up that's what we do here <clears throat> and now you can rewrite t you can take t out which is the integral in its limit the integral we're interested in and then you get <clears throat> pi over cosine pi over 2 times alpha <clears throat> of course divided by sine pi alpha okay so you have your cosine here at the top your sine here at the bottom you can take out the two i's so you're only left with a pi here you can take out the minuses so you're left with a pi here okay and now you can rewrite sine pi i with two sine cosine half the angle and you can take out the cosine and you're left with pi over two sine pi over two alpha okay so there will be another uh, video a follow-up on this where I calculate the exact same integral but in a in a more complex way with different contours but it gives you an excellent idea on how to calculate with contours so I think it's very helpful okay I think this is a great place to stop if you like this video please subscribe and please like and I'll see you in the next one